What about these like essentially basic areas of our lifestyle that we all know are healthy? Exercising regularly, getting sleep, you know, trying to reduce stress, eating a, a healthy diet. Do we do we understand the ways in which these types of behaviors are actually influencing the biology of aging? I think we're getting a much better understanding. So these these kinds of advice have been around for a long time. You know, everybody, you can you can read uh, the anatomist Galen uh, from you know ancient uh, from the classical period, and and you'll see in in Greek in ancient Greek. Uh, the guy has written about benefits of exercise. So, but I think what we're understanding now is what does exercise do? And what exercise does is it uh, helps with all of these factors involved in regeneration. It can regenerate muscle. Muscle loss is a big problem as we age and leading to frailty. And it can uh, even be involved in regeneration of mitochondria. Uh, so, there are a number of pathways that are affected. Sleep is when many of our repair and maintenance mechanisms operate. There's a weird thing about sleep, which I didn't realize until I read a very interesting book called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. And that, and of course, once he mentioned it, it was obvious that sleep is not just because we have a brain or eyes and we can close our eyes and go to sleep. Very primitive animals, even unicellular animals, have the equivalent of sleep. They have circadian rhythm, which is the the program of gene expression changes uh, through the day. And so it's a highly conserved process. You would think sleep shouldn't evolutionarily exist because we're vulnerable to predators, yeah, right? right? It's extremely so dangerous. So in spite of that, the fact that we need sleep and it's preserved means it's doing something really, really important. And some of it is, is you know, proper development, and some of it is, is this maintenance and repair during aging. And diet, of course, we've talked about all these pathways involved in caloric restriction and, and how uh, an important diet is, is, is beneficial. And more than that, a bad diet is also detrimental in many ways. For example, obesity turns on uh, various pathways which are, uh, in a, which are harmful. And I wouldn't have thought obesity would cause cancer, but the link between obesity and cancer is very well established now. Uh, and of course, obesity and heart disease and diabetes is, is very well known. So, so I think this trio, uh, one thing that we, we've learned in the last few decades is how this trio actually works in various ways. We still don't understand all of the details and there's a lot of work going on, but we understand some of the th ways in which they affect our metabolism to keep us healthier uh, as we age. And the, you can think of them as a three-legged stool. For example, if you exercise, you're more likely to sleep better. You know, if you sleep better, you're also going to be less stressed and you're going to uh, not overeat and you, you maybe more feel more like exercising. So they, they tend to act in a synergistic way, a bit like a three-legged stool, uh, all supporting each other. And beyond that, they help you with things like stress, uh, which also uh, is deleterious for aging. And these things... I mean, they do come with some cost, but they're accessible to most to most of us, particularly people that are listening to this show right now and have two hours to, to spare to yeah. to listen to us yeah. uh, talk. Uh, versus, you know, some of the things like Brian Johnson's doing that are extremely expensive. Yeah. Although I should say he probably does exercise and Certainly. watch his diet. And, and all these of are those the foundations, yeah. and I think. To his credit, one of the thing that things that he uh, really underlines and emphasizes to his community is that the majority of the things that we know will influence aging and improve your health span are either free or not that expensive relative to all of the speculative, very expensive things that he's doing. Sure. And that's a good that's a good reminder for people because you could kind of land in this place where you think, "Gosh, I just don't have the means." You know, even in the UK, which has a national health service, the 
life expectancy, the lifespan difference between the, the top 10% and the bottom 10% in, in terms of wealth is over 10 years. And in the US, it's over 15 years. And even worse than that, if you look at the health span, the, the difference in health span is almost double the difference in lifespan. That means the poor are not only living shorter lives, but they're living a bigger fraction of their lives unhealthy, okay? Uh, you know, at, at the end of life. And so we talked about these three measures and how they come at no cost. But, you know, a poor person who's holding down two jobs, doesn't have the time to prepare good food and has to eat on the run, you know, typically some fast food. And as a result, it's also stressed and doesn't sleep well. All of these factors act against you if you're poor. So it's, it's okay to say they're free, but they're only free to people who do have the time. Right, that's you know, still a privileged resources. state. It's still a privilege. I, I, I can acknowledge that. We need to raise the bar as a society and improve quality of life across the board so they become more accessible. Yeah, absolutely. Earlier you, you mentioned that there are some species that live extraordinary, extraordinarily long lives. Uh, Major Mitchell's cockatoo, I think you wrote about. Yes, the, that's an Australian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was I was pleasantly surprised to see that in there, and and we spoke about the shark, the, the Greenland shark. If we think about the biology of aging, some of these things we've gone through, when you when you look at their cells and how they're behaving, are they doing a better job at repairing DNA and yeah. and so if you look at these animals. Many of the animals that are long-lived have very slow metabolism. For example, the Greenland shark has a very slow metabolism. Uh, another darling of aging researchers was something called the naked mole rat, also has a very slow metabolism. And that then slows down a lot of the progression of aging. However, uh, well, Major Mitchell cockatoo doesn't have, I mean, it's a bird and flies around, doesn't have a, a slow metabolism. One thing they've found with uh, some of the whales that are very long lived, and recently the Greenland shark as well, is they tend to have uh, very extensive uh, DNA repair mechanisms. In fact, where we may have one copy of a DNA repair gene, uh, they might have multiple copies. And so that's definitely a possibility that their uh, ability to repair the fundamental damage, uh, you know, at the very beginning, DNA damage, which then may lead to other kinds of uh, problems, uh, are better dealt with. And 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 we don't know whether their ability to clear damage, you know, these things called autophagy, where we clear out debris and unf you know miss. Uh, dysfunctional uh, components from the cell. Uh, we don't know if that's better in these uh, species or not. So it's going to be interesting to study them. But I'm not sure how much relevance that has for humans. Okay, it's interesting as to study to see what's happening. Uh, but then to how how would you implement that in in humans? Are, are we going to do gene therapy and clone in multiple copies of these DNA repair genes? We don't know, we, and we don't know uh, whether that's safe and what, what that what consequence that'll have. Uh, so I, I think uh, right now it's in the realm of academic research. Mm -hmm.